On Tech News Today, Twitter launches a meerkat killer, Facebook launches a range of new products that probably won't kill anything, and the FTC says the people behind Jerk.com are a bunch of jerks. It's all coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. It's time for Twit's annual audience survey, and we want to hear from you. Please visit twit.tv slash survey and let us know what you think. It only takes a few minutes, and your anonymous feedback will help us make Twit even better. We thank you so much for your continued support. Twit.tv slash survey. <laughs> This is Tech News Today for Thursday, March 26th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Casper, an online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the price. Because everyone deserves a great night's sleep, get $50 off any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com slash TNT and entering promo code TNT. And by Shutterstock.com. With over 49 million high-quality stock photos, illustrations, vectors, and video clips, Shutterstock helps you take your creative projects to the next level. For 20% off image subscription packages on your new account, go to Shutterstock.com and use offer code TNT0315. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. My name is Mike Elgin. Welcome to the show. Joining me as co-anchor today is Ars Technica Senior Reviews Editor, Lee Hutchinson. How are you doing, Lee? I'm doing great, Mike. How are you guys doing? We are doing great. I'm doing great. Jason's doing great. I don't know about Carly. She's you're doing. Car, Carly's doing great as well. All We're great. all doing great. Okay, good. And good. it's a great day today. And you know, I'm confused about something. You're my like go-to space guy, and uh, maybe <laughs> you can explain something to me. Why does Sorry. NASA want to snag an asteroid and put it in orbit around the moon? So we could do the whole show on this if you wanted to. But the the real short explanation is uh, there have been a lot of different like potential ways that NASA could continue to exercise its capability, right? I mean, the danger with an organization like NASA is if you don't have it doing something, uh, the people that work there are going to leave and go do something else and you lose knowledge. So in this case, it's sort of a mark time kind of mission to keep NASA busy uh, in between now and whenever they eventually decide with Congress's approval to put someone on Mars. But the plan right now is to, it used to be to go out and grab this whole asteroid, bring it back and put it in one of these Lagrange points between Earth and the moon. But now that's kind of off the table. This new mission they announced the details on yesterday is in about 2019 or 2020, you send a probe out to an asteroid, grab a large boulder, a big chunk of the asteroid, and bring it back to uh, like a cislunar orbit near, near Earth, like in between the Earth and the Moon, and then send one of the new Orion spacecraft that Lockheed is building out to study it. And NASA's positioning it kind of as a, a midway point between, uh, between now and a Mars visit, sort of to, to show off techniques and to, to develop skills that astronauts would need uh, to go journey to Mars. There's also the chance uh, that the technology that gets used here would be used in um, <clears throat> in the event that NASA ever has to do like an asteroid redirect mission. So think like Deep Impact or that Bruce Willis movie where uh, they went up and, and put the rockets on the asteroid and Liv Tyler was in it and they played the Aerosmith song. Yeah, that wouldn't work. Uh, first of all, the Aerosmith song wouldn't work. But the, but if you were trying to redirect a giant asteroid like that, the way they depicted it in that Bruce Willis movie, that actually wouldn't work, would it? Well, you know, there's kind of one of the perpetual questions is, why would you train drilling workers to be astronauts <laughs> when it would probably be simpler to train astronauts to be, you know, drill workers. <laughs> but no, the, the technique shown in that movie, they I, th I think it's been a while, but they drilled into it to implant like a nuclear bomb and then blow the asteroid up, which really wouldn't redirect the asteroid so much as just break into a lot of different pieces, which would then all still hit Earth, thus, you know, still having the same problem as in the first place. It'd be like being shot with a shotgun in the face instead of with a regular gun. Basically, uh, you're yes. You're still going to die. Yeah, right. it's it's not gonna it's not gonna work out now. All right. Well, I'm glad we cleared that up. Anyway, it's it's a fascinating uh, issue. You know, NASA wants its own asteroid, and where are you gonna put it? You know, so I guess that I guess between the Earth and the Moon is as good a place as any. It's probably the only it is. good place. It gives well, it gives you a target to shoot at too. Where the, it, it <laughs> you know it allows it allows NASA to not just like go get the astronaut or astronaut go get the asteroid, but then also gain some experience 
uh, in going out and visiting the chunk that they're going to bring back in. Because, yeah. I mean, remember, cislunar navigation, moving between the Earth and the Moon, is not, it's not easy. You don't just point and go. Uh, it's a complicated gravity ballet that NASA really hasn't done any live work with, with manned spacecraft since the, you know, the, the early 70s, the last Apollo mission. Well, it sounds fascinating. Can't wait till they actually start doing it. And maybe, heck, instead of the Mars mission, they can go get Mars and bring that back. <laughs> there yes. you go. That'd be a little harder. All right, well, why don't we do the tech news? Twitter launched today its meerkat killer called Periscope. Twitter paid nearly $100 million for Periscope in January. Per per uh, Periscope is like meerkat, but it appears to perform better with a lag time of just a second or two, at least in my informal test this morning. Also, unlike Meerkat, Periscope doesn't use Twitter replies as the message system, so it doesn't spam your Twitter feed with all kinds of cryptic messages that only made sense during the streaming video. It also, um, uh, Periscope, Periscope videos can be streamed privately or publicly, are visible for 24 hours after streams end, and can be saved to the camera roll, even though that functionality exists in Meerkat, it was really problematic and buggy and didn't really work very well for a few days after Meerkat launched. Um, uh, Lee, what do you think about Meerkat, Periscope, and all the rest? Are you into the live streaming phenomenon? You know, when I was when Meerkat first landed, which I guess was a couple of weeks ago now, uh, I went to go sign up for it because you know the my my Twitter stream is basically all tech journalists, and we all sort of like. Yes. It's, it's like this constant stream of inside jokes going back and forth. And everybody immediately jumped on Meerkat mm -hmm. uh, and the popularity just skyrocketed. And what kind of scared me about it is when you go to sign up for it, you have to grant the app Twitter permissions to, to interact with your account. And because of the way Twitter does its permission granularity, uh, like the only way to use Meerkat is if you grant the app the ability to post tweets on your behalf to modify your contacts list. It was like this big long list of like, stuff that you have to be okay with the app doing and being kind of conservative and kind of a weenie about my tech permissions i was like no yeah. i don't know if i want to get involved in that plus i mean do you guys really want to watch a live stream of me sitting here in my underpants like doing tech news all day long because you know because <laughs> we don't have an office i'm home office here so you know it'd be like really just me like drinking coffee and typing for like 12 hours straight in my experience people want to see that so I, I've been I, okay. I've been using Meerkat every day doing exactly that uh, until and recently. In your boxers, Mike? You wearing well, your boxers? Well, no, not exactly, <laughs> not exactly. Um, but still, I mean, maybe that would have helped. Uh, maybe it would have hurt. Who knows? Uh, but I, I essentially did that this morning with Periscope, and um, it's a different ball. You know, it's it's a uh, Periscope seems to me to be a better version of Meerkat. Uh, whether you know, like you say, uh, anybody wants to see this, I mean. Um, you know, this is what the Wall Street Journal uh, said um, about this is the fundamental problem with Meerkat and Periscope is that our lives are kind of boring, most of us. And, uh, and who wants to see that kind of stuff? Now, of course, uh, as with Meerkat, Periscope is iOS only for now, much to the chagrin of the Android community. And also, um, Meerkat announced, this is related news, uh, $14 million in additional funding. It's not a lot of funding. They probably need a lot more if they're going to keep being popular, which they probably won't be now that Periscope is here. My feeling is that uh, Meerkat will be uh, forgotten about now that uh, Twitter has uh, uh, Periscope up and running. More news in a sec, but first let's talk about getting a good night's sleep with a Casper mattress. These are fantastic mattresses. You really have to get yourself one. And if you're not really sure if you would uh, like it, you know, I mean, it's kind of a personal thing. You know, people uh, are picky about uh, the comfort of their beds. You know, give it a try. You can actually sleep on it for 100 nights uh, before deciding whether you want to send it back or not. And I, I'm pretty sure you won't because these things are super, super comfortable. They use both latex and memory foam technologies together for a mattress that's like super soft and also uh, plenty uh, firm as well, uh, and it provides long-lasting comfort and support. Um, I've been uh, sleeping on one and sleeping like a baby, and it's just fantastic. Uh, you're going to love it. And of course, if you're going to buy a mattress in a showroom or something like that, you can't tell. Uh, you know, people think they can. So all you can do is lay down and go, I guess that's okay. Um, but you really can't tell whether or not a mattress is right for you unless you actually lose consciousness on it and sleep through the night uh, at least a few times, and then you will know for sure. Get a Casper mattress, just $500 for a twin, $950 for a king size, and compared to industry averages, that's an outstanding price. And you can save an additional $50 as one of our audience members by going to casper.com slash TNT and entering promo code TNT. Easy to remember TNT for tech news today. That's casper.com slash TNT and promo code TNT.
Well, uh, let's jump to our next story. Facebook announced a range of new products and services yesterday at its F8 2015 Developers Conference. The company announced, for example, an API for developers to add on to Messenger, Messenger for Business, new plugins for embedded videos and comments, spherical videos, Facebook analytics for apps, Live Rail, and Parse for the Internet of Things, of all things. Uh, Sarah Mitroff is a reviews editor for CNET and joins us now to talk about some of this. How are you doing, Sarah? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great, thank you. Now, as expected yesterday, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg announced Messenger as a platform. Does anybody want this except Facebook? Well, so obviously it's a great benefit for Facebook, but for users, that means you can now share things from other apps into Messenger. And I say things, it's kind of broad because it all depends on the apps you're using. There are so many apps out there that let you create new kinds of content, whether that's like GIFs or videos or photos, things like Giphy, Imgur, even the Weather Channel. And now these apps can take advantage of this platform and you can share content from these apps into Messenger in a chat, and it's going to appear in line with your conversation. Yeah. Now, Lee, um, this, it occurred to me, and we did this live yesterday. Leo and I uh, did the F8 conference live at, you know, during the stream, and we're going to do it again today. They're going to be talking about virtual reality, so stick around at 10 a.m. Pacific for that. Uh, but it occurred to both Leo and I, we were struck by the idea that one of the benefits of Messenger or something like Messenger is that it's not email. It's not full of junk. It doesn't have a spam. It doesn't have any of the rest. And it seemed to, to both of us that Facebook is trying to create a spammy platform out of something uh, where the, the very nature of it, the, the, the main benefit of it is it doesn't uh, become cluttered with spam and junk and, you know, uh, jib jab videos and all the rest. Um, do you think this is a, a mistake on the part of Facebook? Do you think they're going to wreck Messenger? Well, so for them, I mean, they want to take over all of your kinds of messaging. They would like to replace email if they could. They want you to use Messenger as the one place you communicate with everybody. And I think for them, they, they want to give users that choice. For now, you've only been able to share things within Facebook that they've let you share. You know, that's stickers, that's photos, that's video, that's anything that you can create using that app, and then you can share it out. And they just want to allow more people to share more kinds of content and then thus, you know, giving them an alternative to every other kind of messenger platform out there. That said, you're right. It could become very spammy when people are sending you messages with GIFs or videos or whatnot, and it's cluttering up your message system. I mean, you can reply in line with those kinds of messages, but if you don't want to, they're, they could just very well clutter up your conversation if you don't want them there. Sarah, I've got a question for you. What do you think yesterday's set of announcements says, um, if it's possible to extrapolate about Facebook's direction? Like what, from an overall kind of 50,000 foot view, what does the, the stuff that they've most recently announced and all this platform stuff say about what you think they're going to be wanting to do and, you know, five years out, 10 years out? Right. I mean, they definitely see that their competition, that other apps that allow you to send messages, WhatsApp, it, all those really popular apps that let you plug in all different kinds of content. They see that that's out there. They see that there's the pressure to be like those other apps that are wildly popular overseas, wildly popular, growing everywhere. Um, and so I think they just want to make sure that they're not missing any of those markets. They want to make sure that they're not missing anyone who wants to communicate with anybody else. And, you know, we've already known Facebook has wanted to be everything. They want to be the place that you connect with your fans and family, that you get your news, that you shop, that you do anything. And so I feel like these announcements are just furthering that agenda that they've had in place for a really long time. Now, Sarah, you know, that exactly to the point that you're saying there, that Facebook wants to be everywhere. They want to be all things to all people. I don't think all people want Facebook to be all things to all people. Um, some of these things, of course, make perfect sense. For example, you know, adding spherical video, YouTube has had that for a while. Uh, the, you know, the virtual reality world is coming. And, of course, Facebook is going to be a major player in that with uh, Oculus VR. And so spherical video kind of makes sense to a certain extent, I guess. You know, it falls into their wheelhouse. But things like the Internet of Things on their Parse platform makes no sense at all. I don't think Facebook <laughs> has, has earned anyone's trust. Who wants to put their, you know, home automation stuff or, or their business Internet of Things devices on a fa Facebook platform? I just don't see any demand for this at all. Do you, uh, am I missing something here, Sarah? 
No, I would agree. I, I think in a lot of ways that they're trying to throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. They see that every other company out there is doing VR, is doing Internet of Things, is doing all of this stuff. And, you know, I think on a lot of levels, they're trying to compete with so many different companies. They're trying to compete with the Samsungs and the Apples and all these hardware manufacturers, but also with like Twitter and all these social networks. I mean, they're just trying to be every single thing that they can be to every single person. And you're right. I don't think there's a huge demand for these more niche types of technology that a lot of people just haven't even experienced yet, aren't interested in yet. And if you think about Facebook, I mean, my mom's on Facebook. My grandmother is on Facebook. Like, it's the general population who's still a little bit wary or completely just not aware that this technology is there. And so I think they're way ahead of their time or they're trying to do this and it, it's probably not going to last for very long. I can't imagine that they're going to make waves with Parse and these spherical videos. I also think that Facebook is a little bit delusional. Everybody uses Facebook. They have unbelievable engagement. They have all kinds of users, probably more, more users than any uh, company outside of China. And yeah, well, pro uh, even outside of China, they, they're just enormous. And I suspect that they think it's because people like Facebook. And I don't know anybody who likes Facebook. Everybody <laughs> likes the people that they like who are on Facebook. Everyone's on Facebook. So I like my mother. I like I like all these people. That's why I go to Facebook um, because that's where the people are. But I don't think anytime you extend some functionality that doesn't involve the social graph, as Mark Zuckerberg calls it. There's no demand for it, as far as I can tell. Uh, Sarah Mitroff is at CNET.com. You can follow her on Twitter at Sarah Mitroff. Thank you so much for joining us today, Sarah. Thank you. Apple is introducing a trade-in program for iPhones in China, according to Bloomberg. Buyers will be able to turn in old iPhones in Chinese Apple stores for store credit, plus Foxconn's, uh, which is Apple's contract manufacturer there in China. It's a Taiwan company, but they do most of the manufacturing in China. will also buy iPhones directly, then sell them as part of the Apple program through its e-commerce sites, eFeihu and FLNet, and also through the Taobao online store. Uh, Lee Hutchinson, um, I think Apple is a little bit worried because they had an amazing fourth quarter. They had an unprecedented fourth quarter that made Apple the most valuable company in the history history of mankind and now they got to follow up on that and not disappoint everybody with laggard sales and so they they seem to be doing all kinds of things uh, within the United States they're accepting android devices as part of the trade in deal and now in China they're they're really pushing this whole trade in thing because they know that the one thing that they have is lots of people out there already have iPhones so if they get people to trade them in for a new iPhone then their sales will be boosted um, but i guess this makes a lot of sense and they certainly have the infrastructure to do it Oh, sure. I mean, well, I worked sales for a long time before I, in, in a past life, before I became a tech journalist. Uh, and you, the question is always, you know, it's great that you're, it's great that this quarter is doing well, but, uh, you know, the next quarter is going to be the most important quarter ever. The next quarter is going to be the most important quarter ever. And it's always the next quarter is the most important quarter ever. And that's kind of the hidden danger behind you know, bringing in a record quarter where you knock it out of the park and you clobber the guidance is that, well, the guidance for next quarter is going to be even higher now. Uh, and it's difficult to build on. And it's very difficult when you're at the top of that pile. You know, where are you going to go? Um, and like you said, a tremendous amount of Apple's growth in the past quarter came from, uh, came not just developing markets in general, but China specifically. Um, but, you know, there's, there's kind of another side to this, to this buyback program, too, and that's kind of the e-waste recycling side of it. And I know yeah. that's just an absolute enormous issue, especially in kind of the same developing markets that, that, that Apple is building sort of its massive new profits on. Um, and I, I'm not, like, as completely familiar with the matter as you are here. Did they say that there's going to be, like, as when, they, when they're doing this buyback program and they're taking back in these, you know, tremendous amounts of handsets, uh, are, they, are they then recycling them? and like putting them back into, you know, a responsible like way of, of, of you know, dealing with the silicon waste and everything? My, my belief is that they're only buying ones that they believe they can sell as whole ah, phones. Okay. And then they're, they're, you know, refurbing them probably to the minimum amount, probably, you know, battery replacement or something like that. But, mm -hmm. that, but, uh, but I'm not certain about that. I mean, the ideal thing would be for there to be a price no matter what condition it's in. And if it's in a horrible condition, you know, buy it at a low price and recycle it or do something like that. But, um, but no, I think this is for resale. And, you know, that's going to okay, cause yeah. them another problem down the road, too, because they're going to get, you know, if they really have a compelling offering and they're selling used phones, then there are lots of people who won't be buying new phones, presumably. <laughs> 
presumably they've got to they have to define and continue to carry forward that that value proposition that that value prop that word that all those sales guys keep throwing around i mean that's that's kind of the key and so far they've been very successful at it i mean you buy an apple phone because you want to buy an apple phone and a lot of times if you if you stack your phone buying experience up as purely like a product of tech specs Apple doesn't come out on top, and yet that hasn't stopped them from absolutely dominating. Yeah, and I think they're also facing a, a world in which they're going to want to be selling Apple Watches, and if people have a uh -huh. certain budget for their phone, they're going to maybe want to factor in the Apple Watch. And so maybe if they're selling refurbed phones with a new Apple Watch or something like that, eventually refurbed Apple Watches, people will be able to afford it to a certain extent in China. Um, but that's, you know, already people in China spend uh, several times more of, you know, as a function of the percentage of their income on phones and gadgets than they do yeah. in the U.S. and elsewhere. So um, it's going to be an uphill battle for them to sell Apple Watches, which, again, require iPhones. So you got to buy both. Well, do, you, do you have your, uh, your $17,000 rose gold Apple Watch on order, Mike? Uh, yeah, I was on the fence. I was actually uh, <laughs> trying to think about whether I should uh, take garbage bags full of $20 bills and flush them down the toilet all day <laughs> when the Apple Watch ships or if I should go buy that, but I haven't decided. So mm, we'll see. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, the FTC ruled unanimously yesterday against the website jerk.com. The site was run by Napster co-founder John Fanning, and it presented users with personal profiles harvested from Facebook data, along with one of, one of two labels, jerk or not jerk, not a jerk, which were added by jerk.com staff. By paying a $30 membership fee, victims were told they could have negative comments removed, but the FTC found that even after paying, comments were rarely removed. Jerk.com is being required by the FTC to delete all personal data, and the site, of course, no longer exists. What a bunch of jerks, Lee Hutchinson. <laughs> this sounds like just a straight shakedown, man. Yeah, it's pay horrible. Us, pay us $30 and we'll stop saying negative stuff about you. We, we promise. Yeah, it's horrible. It's awful. All yeah, right. Well, well, I mean, it's 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 fanning, right? It's just kind of the trajectory exactly. from Napster to Jerkster. <laughs> That's right. I can't wait to find out what he launches next. Yeah. The HTC One M9 is scheduled to go on sale in the U.S. starting April 10th, but you can get one earlier by placing your order after midnight tonight on the HTC.com website. I don't know when you're going to get it, but you're going to get it supposedly before April 10th. Apple's Beats streaming music service will be headed by. Wait for it, Nine Inch Nails leader Trent Reznor, according to the New York Times. The Beats music service may include aspects of the Beats music app, including curated playlists, and Reznor's title is Chief Creative Officer for Beats. Boy, Apple's hiring uh, people from Hollywood. Yeah, man, it's, it's, they're, getting, they're getting all kinds of names. Everybody's joining up with Apple. Uh, there, was, there was a funny tweet that I saw roll through this morning. I don't remember who posted it. I'd have to go back in the timeline, but it said something like, Apple has managed to create a world where like, Dr. Dre and Bono and Trent Reznor sit down in, uh, in a meeting room and listen to and watch PowerPoints all day long. It's really kind of funny. Yeah, it's weird. And I can't wait till they hire Eminem to be director of HR. <laughs> that should be fun. That'll work. Yeah. Well, in product update news, Microsoft said yesterday that it plans to make some features of Office free for phones and tablets. Specifically, Microsoft would not charge for the basic editing and viewing features of Office for devices with screens of 10.1 inches or smaller. At some point, uh, Lee Hutchinson, they're going to have to stop giving away software. They, they used to be the company that never gave away anything and charged through the news for everything. And now they just can't, uh, they can't uh, give enough away. Well, I think this is, I mean, this is kind of the shift from Balmer to, to Satya, right? You're seeing, you're seeing, uh, you know, now that we're kind of a couple of years into the kind of Satya's transition, or, or I guess we're not quite that far in, but we're, we're beginning to see like corporate initiatives that were spearheaded and run by Balmer tapering off and things that were started by Nadella sort of like tapering on. Um, and I think finding new ways to to monetize and get revenue streams out of out of software ways that aren't necessarily traditionally Microsoftian or more kind of app centric -y, you know, Apple-y new kind of ways of doing business. We're going to see more and more of that uh, because there's that expectation that you know uh, that that you that that apps are kind of a value add thing and and the cost should be relatively low. So when you're talking about Office Mobile, it ties in with that. And at the same time, you know, this is kind of Microsoft's new thing, this one Windows everywhere, one interface everywhere. You know, they want, uh, whether you're on an Xbox or, or your computer or your portable device or whatever, they want this all to be tied in almost Facebook-like, like we were talking about. Like everything that they do, Windows should look the same and be the same on all their platforms. I think this is going to be part of that.
Yep, and it seems to be working. I, I, I hear nothing but good. Well, I hear mostly good things about Microsoft these days from people who used to grumble all the time. And uh -huh. so they are slowly changing their image uh, for the better. So that is a good thing. Well, one last product update for you. Google made changes to its Keep note-taking platform yesterday, adding labels and recurring reminders. Um, I'm a big user of Keep, uh, Lee Hutchinson. I don't know if you do, but it's, it's a pretty cool app. Uh, it's pretty useful. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, I love recurring reminders. So this is actually making it more useful as a to-do list app. Now, this is interesting. I'm going to have to try this out. I don't usually use Keep. I've actually been using, uh, funny, talking about Microsoft, I've been using OneNote mobile huh. for a long time now. But this looks kind of cool, especially if they've got it tied in now with this with this new remindery stuff and they've got improvements in there. Yeah, and it's uh, an alternative for Evernote, I guess. It's very different from Evernote, very much yeah. lighter than Evernote. But for people who think that Evernote is a bit much and a little bit too too much stuff going on, then Keep, I think, is a, is a good option for those people. Yeah, that's interesting. Could be. Evernote's pretty heavy, but yeah, this could be neat. Yeah, could be. All right, well, we got a little bit more news for you coming up in a sec, but first, let's talk about Shutterstock. If you're a blogger, if you have a small business, you're doing ads or whatever it is you're doing online, you have to have really great photography, but you might not be a great photographer yourself. Most of us aren't. Uh, that won't stop you on Shutterstock.com because they have 49 million High quality stock photos, illustrations, vectors, and video clips. And it's always kept up to date because they add 370,000 images every week or thereabouts. One little secret about Shutterstock that I like to tell people who are bloggers in the tech world, you can search for brands. So you can search for things like Facebook or Microsoft or Apple or something like that. And you will actually get, if you're looking at the video version, we're looking for Facebook Happy, uh, <laughs> a miracle. There's actual pictures under Facebook and Happy. So, uh, but, but Facebook is, uh, is a great example of a, of a type of uh, a search you can do and you find the, the logos and you find pictures of people using Facebook and, you know, any kind of illustration that you're going to need for a blog when you're talking about Facebook. You don't want to just grab some photo off of, you know, off the internet somewhere because that belongs to somebody here by paying for the photo, by paying Shutterstock.com a very low price, you will have the legal right to use these award-winning uh, photographs, and it's just a fantastic uh, service. And you can search for subject, color, file type, gender, emotion, whatever. Uh, it's really the color feature is really great if you're trying to match colors on a website that you're branding with color. Uh, that is just a fantastic service, and uh, you can share light boxes. So if you're collaborating on a project, it's very very easy to do. You can try Shutterstock today by signing up for a free account, no credit card needed. Just Start an account and begin using Shutterstock to help imagine what your ne next project could be like and save favorite images to a light box to review later. Once you decide to buy, use offer code TNT0315 and new accounts will receive 20% off image subscription packages. That's Shutterstock.com and for 20% off image subscription packages on new accounts, use offer code TNT0315. And we thank Shutterstock for their support of Tech News Today. Well, in courtroom drama news, Motorola was found by a jury in Delaware to have infringed on a patent owned by the patent troll company Intellectual Ventures. The patent is related to a multimedia, to multimedia messager, messaging. A second patent in the case was found to be invalid. So there you go. Uh, you know, uh, Lee Hutchinson, uh, patent trolling a, a pays, apparently, especially if you're Intellectual Ventures. This is one of the more successful patent trolls out there. Yeah, I was going to say intellectual ventures is kind of the dictionary definition of a non-practicing entity or whatever the polite word is these days for for patent troll. They're, uh, they they just don't do a lot. And they've been around for quite some time. Uh, and if I'm remembering right, they actually had kind of a, a layoff round last year. Uh, but it sounds like with this Motorola win, they could they could kind of be trending back towards success. And it's interesting when you look at the at the when you look at the language that they use in their press releases, especially about this Motorola thing, how they characterize this as sort of a victory for innovators and a victory for business and a victory for the good guys. And it's like, well, I mean, come on, who's, who are we talking about good guys here? I mean, this is, it's kind of like, you know, alien versus predator. It's these, you know, whichever one of these wins we lose, but you know, in the battle between sort of mega corporation and patent troll, it's difficult to see who you want to come out ahead. But uh, I mean, ultimately I think from a tech perspective, it's healthier 
for, for industries in general when the companies who actually use this technology win lawsuits rather than the companies that just want to, you know, parasitize and make money from licensing crap out that they don't that they don't use. Totally agree with that. And this was uh, founded in 2000 by Nathan Mervold, who is famous for, for working as a senior executive at Microsoft and also for Edward Jung also formerly of Microsoft. And, uh, you know, Nathan Mervold himself is personally a real cheerleader for this kind of patent trolling, uh, making uh, the argument that you characterized uh, that it's good for innovation. And his argument essentially is that somebody invented this stuff. And so it's good for companies to make sure that they purchase that and be as aggressive as possible at monetizing that invention. And so if, if there are patent trolling companies that are there to pick up these inventions when the original um, uh, uh, inventor is not around to do that, then it's good for innovation. But like you say, I mean, this is really the problem is that a lot of this stuff shouldn't be patentable, you know, well, software I mean, and stuff like that. <clears throat> there's some merits to, to that argument about, I mean, there's there's two arguments. There's the patentability part, and then there's the, you know, somebody should be making money from it. You know, you got to look at why patents exist in the first place. Patents exist so that, uh, you know, ostensibly so that an inventor can make money for a limited amount of time, and then whatever the inventor has invented can be released into the public domain for society in general to benefit. I mean, that's the theory, right? Uh, but you end up with sort of hyper, hyper, hyper specialized parasite companies that exist only to make money on packaging and licensing patents. It, it just doesn't really seem like sort of an end result that was expected or anticipated or desired when setting up a system like this. The guy's right. I mean, you know, maybe somebody does have to make money on it. I see the point of view. I just don't agree with it. Yeah, somebody should invent a, an alternative, the patent system. That'd be a great and, invention. And patent it. And patent it. Exactly. All right. Well, our TNT fan of the day is William Rodriguez in Longwood, Florida, who posted this picture on Google+. And there is a lovely office with a nice view. And there we are, Tech News Today. Uh, it looks like Google Plus on the right there as well. How do you watch or listen to TNT? Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Google Plus, Twitter, or Facebook and use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT and we will find it. Lee Hutchinson, what the heck are you working on these days and where can people read it? Ooh, I'm writing about all kinds of neat space stuff. I've got a story in work right now on the history of Soviet rocketry, which will wow. be really interesting. And you can read my stuff at ArsTechnica.com. Wonderful. Thank you so much for coming here today and I'll see you next time. next time you're on the show. Thanks, Mike. All right, Always thanks. fun. Thanks, Lee. You can subscribe to Tech News Today on RSS, a great way to subscribe. Or you can choose another way to subscribe at twit.tv slash TNT. You can also watch us live every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC at live.twit.tv or on the app or browser plugin of your choice, which you can find at twit.tv slash apps. If you're ever in Northern California, come on in and watch us as part of our studio audience. Just don't throw anything at me, please. Uh, unless it's, uh, you know, good food or something like that. You can throw that. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter. Tech News Today TV is our Twitter name and you can follow me personally on YouTube. Just go to youtube.com slash user slash Mike Elgin of 1E. Let us know what you think. Send email to tnt at twit.tv or call 260-TNT-SHOW. And don't miss Tech News Tonight at 4 p.m. Pacific every single weeknight. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the Tech News Today. My name's Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow.